question. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, from San Francisco. I buried my head in the sand for our unfortunate warriors <laughs> last night. Um, but you, it's hard to stay on top. <laughs> and uh, there's more excitement, actually, when you're hungry and you want that. So I congratulate, actually, the Toronto Raptors for uh, some great basketball last night. Um, so um, as Dr. Tropa said, I, uh, I'm a general internist, um, and I, I began early in my career doing work in kidney disease because I was interested in technology assessment and outcomes research. And, and I began to, uh, looking at treatments like erythropoietin when it first came on the market in the late 80s and then different dialysis treatments and, their, and how they were better in terms of improving either mortality or quality of life. But what I also discovered was the enormous burden of kidney disease in ethnic minorities and the precursors of kidney disease, uh, the burden of the precursors of hypertension and diabetes. And so um, part of my work began then a pathway to look at and see how we could uh, ameliorate disparities in kidney disease. And um, a lot of my mentees have worked in this area as well. And that's the subject of my talk today. Um, and um, it's, it's uh, an important area that I've enjoyed working in. These are my uh, conflict of interest disclosures. I, I actually has to, I'm on a government committee, the PCORI uh, methodology committee, and so this is online. So it's my universal disclosure agreement. I don't have to uh, do it again, but I've put it up there. Um, so I always think it's great at Grand Rounds to start with a patient. So let me, if you can bear with me, let me start with a patient. This is a 35-year-old male who presents to his local emergency room for generalized weakness, nausea, and vomiting. And his history of present illness is that he had increasing lower extremity edema for two months. It was seen by a local private physician. And no lab work was done, but he was placed on furosemide, and his edema improved. But he had worsening weakness uh, with a 15-pound weight loss over two months and now nausea and vomiting of three days duration. His past medical history was not sig uh, significant, no hypertension, diabetes, or cardiovascular disease. He did have a family history of hypertension. Uh, and he worked as a farm, works a farm worker in Northern California, but resides in Oregon. Uh, so lives near the border, and came to the U.S. from the Dominican Republic at age 13 with parents of African descent. He has no, he's on no medications, and on review of systems, uh, it's remarkable that he had uh, shortness of breath with exertion or orthopnea. On physical exam, he was a chronically uh, ill-appearing young man in no acute distress uh, with an elevated blood pressure, elevated heart rate, an elevated respiratory rate, and a, a low O2 SAT. His physical exam was really unremarkable, but his laboratory examination showed a potassium of 6.3, bicar low bicarbonate, and a an large anion gap, but remarkably uh, BUN of 240, creatinine of 28. His EKG showed sinus tachycardia, chest x-ray showed interstitial edema. And he was admitted, seen by the nephrology service, a temporary catheter was placed and hemodialysis started. So I always like to ask this question, what strikes you about this case? Has anybody seen a case like this before? No? Yes? Mm hmm Yeah, so maybe out in the community, you know, see somebody like this with edema, yeah, put them on a diuretic. You know, health insurance is clearly uh, a big Mm-hmm. So, yeah, access to, access to health care. So what does that mean? Um, no opportunity for primary care that might have prevented 
uh, this. So, so let me go through. Here's what I think. We have an ethnic minority patient with kidney failure, late presentation for care, poorly prepared for kidney failure, no health insurance, as you said, and had urgent initiation of hemodialysis, possibly limiting optimal treatment. Um, and I think for me is why do we see this? Why do we see individuals such a, a such a young age, often ethnic minorities, that develop kidney uh, kidney failure? So here's my premise. My premise is that science on disparities, clinical care with diverse patients, and education about disparities enhances all of human health. And I believe that learning about disparities allows the examination of complex interactions that contribute to human health, interactions between biology and clinical and environmental and social and behavioral uh, factors. And so I'm going to, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is this intersection. So um, I always like to say, why is this important? Well, this slide shows the uh, race and ethnic composition uh, of the United States, uh, California, where I live, and the hospital where I work. And you can see that um, uh, in our population now, uh, about 61% are majority uh, Americans. Uh, but by uh, demographers predict that by 2050, actually what we consider uh, majority Americans will actually be in the minority uh, when you look at ethnic minorities all together. In California, we passed that mark in about 2005. Um, and if you look in San Francisco, uh, we also passed that mark. Um, the hospital I practice at is, is a very interesting hospital because I almost say we have um, almost every ethnic group in uh, almost equal uh, proportion, which allows actually uh, a lot of my faculty to study issues around uh, a, uh, race, ethnic, socioeconomic uh, disparities. So health disparities have been recognized for many years. I remember in 1985, um, this landmark report, which was called the Heckler Report after the, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, and it was one of the first reports that documented health disparities among racial and ethnic minorities in the United States. And this is what it said. It said, it said disparities are an affront both to our ideals and to the ongoing genius of American medicine. And it became a driving force to, as, a, as just exposure of disparities uh, to advance uh, health equity uh, in America. So disparities, what do we mean by disparities? This, this, disparity is often defined in the dictionary as a difference or lack of equality. But the Institute of Medicine or National Academy of Medicine is now called, um, said health care should be safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. Equitable as providing care that does not vary in quality because of personal characteristics such as gender, ethnicity, geographic location, or socioeconomic status. I think most importantly, this, a disparity is something that it, a difference that exists when clinical appropriateness and patient preferences have already been taken into account. So race, what do we mean by race? It's a, it's a loaded term in our society. And here's some de definitions. Uh, Webster's says it's a group of people united or classified together on the basis of common history, nationality, or, or geographic distribution. Uh, the National Academy said it's a construct of human variability based on perceived differences in biology, physical appearance, and behavior. That, and that's interesting, perceived differences, not a biologic reality. And I think um, what I think is a in, the most interesting definition is this article that actually was in JAMA by Mike Bamshad that said, information about genetic group membership captured by notions of race is in general less than that obtained by making inferences of ancestry for, from geographic or explicit genetic data. 
And what he did in this, uh, in this uh, expose said, uh, showed that two individuals who come from the same race, looking at the genetic distance between them as well as individuals of another race, Asian Americans, and showing that the, the, the genetic distance proportionately can even be higher within someone, individuals of the same race. And what we now know is commonly from 23andMe and Ancestry.com is over here where we all know that we uh, all are, have a makeup of different ancestries. And that is often the most informative uh, information uh, about ethnic diversity now. So what is ethnicity? Uh, people define this as shared social, cultural, and historical experiences stemming from common national or regional backgrounds. And, but the interpretation may vary. Uh, in fact, if you ask individuals who are Hispanics with the Pew Research Center, they, two thirds of Hispanic adults saying being Hispanic is part of their racial background. So, there is confusion about what race and ethnicity and how people uh, identify. So health disparities have been recognized for many years, as I told you through that Heckler report over 35 years now. And the National Academy in 2002 did this report that I think we all know called Unequal Treatment. And what they pointed out was this large and consistent body of research that documented existence of disparities, concentrating on the variation in medical procedures and quality of care that were uh, received uh, by race, uh, even when a variety of factors are taken into account. And they called for increased awareness, the use of evidence-based guidelines to, to narrow the gap of disparities, more minority providers, and made a, a, a statement about having interpreters uh, in our environment, which now have become ubiquitous. So we know that there's been non-uniformity of health among racial and ethnic groups. It's been extensively documented. For example, life expectancy at, death, at birth varies, infant mortality, Death rates for various diseases are higher in ethnic minorities. And morbidity, many different diseases are more prevalent. Um, and those differences um, may narrow, but they persist even after accounting for a variety of factors like socioeconomic status, insurance, lifestyle factors, and clinical factors. Um, my former colleagues at Hopkins actually did a study where they looked at the cost of disparities. And they said that the combined cost, they calculated the combined cost of health inequalities and premature death in the United States accounted for $1.24 trillion. That is enough to pay for 10 years of Obamacare, okay? So um, if we could eliminate disparities, we, it, it, we would not only save lives, improve quality of life, but we would also uh, save dollars. So um, I, I love this article that uh, Chris Murray did some years ago, looking at the eight Americans, and he looked at mortality uh, across uh, races, counties, and race counties in the United States. Um, and this, this is what he did. He arrayed these eight Americas, and there's a general description here, of either by race or by where uh, these counties were located, um, and also looked at the average income per capita and the percent completing high school. And I'll just point out a couple of things. So in, in this uh, seventh uh, county, it was southern low-income blacks, where the average per capita income was $10,000, and 61% had completed high school, compared to, let's say, middle America, where the average per capita income is, is more than two times greater, and 30% more uh, graduate from high school. And then he arrayed these Americas in this way, looking at life expectancy at birth over many 
uh, years showing that marked disparities in life expectancy in males, um, depending on either where you live or your race or ethnic uh, uh, background. And this was similar for males as well. So very, very interesting uh, data. And data that we were, um, haven't really improved uh, that much. So let me get to my topic, which is uh, kidney failure. And kidney failure is up to three times greater in race and ethnic minorities. This data comes from the United States Renal Data System uh, that looks at all individuals who develop end-stage uh, kidney disease in the United States. And this shows the incidence per million population. And for African Americans, it's 8.18 per million. Um, and you can see that compares to white Americans, where it's 287 per million. Uh, and you can see that Native Americans also have a higher incidence of kidney failure, uh, Asians slightly higher, and Hispanics higher as well. And what's interesting, like the patient I showed you, if you look at the mean age of onset of kidney failure, it's lower uh, by up to five years in minority patients than in majority patients. So we know, actually, that we're making some progress. This shows the incident rate in different ethnic groups over time. And we began to see, actually, a leveling of end-stage renal disease in almost uh, every population. But still, among African Americans, it's, it's high. And a couple years ago, we published this work in the Annals of Internal Medicine looking at earlier stage kidney disease, the CKD prevalence uh, among different groups, and saw also a what looked like a leveling off in earlier stage chronic kidney disease. Um, though not significant, this blue line shows the line for African Americans, which may be uh, uh, going up. Um, so treating end-stage kidney disease is costly, both personally and financially. A dialysis patient that is aged 50 to 54 years has eight remaining years of life expectancy compared to an ind individual in the general population of 30 years. And their cost, the cost of care for dialysis is eight to 10 times greater and the quality of life is poor unless you're able to get a transplant, which normalizes these. So there's a great need to preempt illness upstream through molecular knowledge, clinical therapeutics, and behavioral interventions. Um, I, I love this slide that was done by uh, my colleagues, Larry Apple, in the AS study. Uh, that shows the cumulative incidence of events in the African-American study of kidney disease. This was a cohort study. Uh, well, actually, it was a clinical trial that compared uh, ACE inhibitors uh, uh, in individuals who, uh, uh, who had kidney disease to those with not, treated not with ACE inhibitors. And this, these were the first three years of the trial, which you know this because we ACE inhibitors are now part of our armamentarium for chronic kidney disease, showing that there was separation uh, in uh, this uh, cumulative, uh, in this uh, aggregate event of doubling of serum creatinine, ESRD, or death. But what's interesting, they follow patients after the study, and if you look over 10 years, over 50% of the cohort still went on to develop that endpoint, showing that our therapies actually are really halfway therapies. Although they make a difference, we have a lot more uh, progress to make. Um, my colleagues at UCSF, uh, Car Carmen Peralta, did this study um, looking at earlier rates, earlier uh, uh, rates of uh, kidney disease uh, among uh, African Americans shown here in the solid line and whites in the dotted line. And what this shows is that is the EGFR, so higher EGFR is, is better, and by age. And what you, what you see here is that EGFR declines with age, but actually 
that inflection point in which it turns down is higher in African Americans uh, than in whites, despite the fact that, in fact, African Americans may have uh, less prevalence of early stage uh, kidney disease. And so what we now believe is that the higher incidence of kidney failure among African Americans appears to be due to a faster rate of disease progression rather than a greater prevalence of early stage disease. And the question that I and others have been trying to look at, are what are the contributing factors to that acceleration? Um, I love this term uh, that actually was put out by uh, the Environmental Health Institute called the exposome, because what it says is that in addition to biology and genomics and its derivatives, that we need to measure all the lifetime exposures, environment, diet, lifestyle, health care policy, because all of these interact in a way in an individual that uh, causes disease progression um, or uh, even resilience in, in health. And it's a way of thinking about and teasing apart the uh, effect of different uh, determinants of disparities. So what I'm going to do is uh, show, you, show you the way I have thought about kidney disease and my colleagues of the susceptibility, in initiation, and progression of factors contributing disparities. And we're going to go through this list and show you some examples of the work that I've been interested in. So um, some, some people in the South, uh, Barry Freeman, uh, did a study early, early where he went and into dialysis units in the southern, uh, southeastern United States, 26,000 uh, patients. And he asked them, do you have a first or second degree relative who was also being treated for ESRD? And what he found is a whopping 22% of the people in dialysis units had a first or second degree relative. But it was much greater for African Americans than it was for whites. And then this study was repeated in the general population, so the, the, the prevalence of, of having a relative was lower, but still more striking among African Americans than among uh, whites. Uh, raising the issue of whether there are genetic factors that may influence uh, kidney disease. Um, I had the opportunity of being involved in um, the study that Dr. Trovich talked about, the choices for healthy outcomes and caring for ESRD, where we uh, assembled a cohort of end-stage renal disease patients and followed them over time in the United States, collecting uh, biologic specimens, medical records, and questionnaires. And we've been able to look at a variety of different factors and supported uh, a lot of the work of others. And, Proud to say that Brad Astor uh, did uh, contributed a, a lot to some of the work that was in the Choice Study, particularly around vascular access. But we use this in a data from this, in a case control study um, to look at genetics. Um, and what we thought was we thought we had found the reason. We found this single nucleotide polymorphism, MYH9. Uh, that was associated with non-diabetic end-stage renal disease only in African Americans. And we said, wow, this is, this is really amazing. Um, and a variety of other studies, this was done in 2008, and a variety of other studies then uh, over time began looking at the same gene, not only in non-diabetic kidney disease, but in other kidney disease focal uh, uh, segmental glomerular sclerosis and HIV nephropathy uh, and in hypertensive ESRD, showing actually that this uh, uh, was associated with ESRD, but also ApoL1. What we now know is we were wrong. Uh, we were wrong about that this was MYH9. It was in fact, ApoL1, which is a gene, a gene uh, the gene for ApoL1 is in linkage disequilibrium with MYH9. And, and what we now know is that this, the ApoL1 mutants uh, confer 
uh, at associate, there's an association between an increased risk for non-diabetic kidney disease. We don't know the mechanism. We do know that, in fact, there's a, a reason that this, uh, these single nucleotide polymorphisms have been inherited because uh, individuals who have these mutant alleles are able to lyse trypanosomes, the, the organism that causes African sleeping sickness. And what's amazing is this gra this shows a, a geographic graph of Africa where the areas in high green are areas that are endemic uh, in, uh, in African sleeping sickness. Uh, and then where people have sampled in the, pro in the population the APOL1 uh, gene frequencies. And while there's not exact overlap in the high uh, epidemic areas, but in most of the areas, they seem to overlap. And this slide shows actually where the Setsi fly vector, uh, vector for uh, uh, sleeping sickness uh, uh, resides in those areas. So we believe this is so, uh, how this arose for, from selection. It turns out that about 10, when you look at most studies, 10 to 15 percent of the African American population has uh, these mutant alleles. And this is work uh, actually that Brad contributed uh, uh, to uh, in the AST study that shows um, uh, this is the outcomes patients free from uh, kidney disease over time. Um, and this shows that if you have no copies uh, or one copy of the APOL risk variant, that uh, you have a less uh, a chance of developing uh, the outcome of kidney disease. And this is true regardless of proteinuria status. So really powerful data in this cohort study now uh, with genetics. But what's interesting is that um, not everyone is the same. In fact, this shows the prevalence of um, different uh, EGFR slopes over time. In individuals who are white, who have uh, low risk, one APOL1 risk allele, and then high risk, two uh, APOL1 uh, 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 risk alleles. And you can see there is a, a, a difference here, but look at the overlap among these. So what we know is that why, why do some people develop kidney disease and others d don't? And so we, a lot of work is going into how much does APOL1 contribute to the disparity? How is it important compared to other modifiable risk factors? And are APOL1 risk uh, variants more susceptible to known kidney injur injury agents? Are there other gene, gene interactions? And most importantly, even if we know the status, and this is the issue today, what can we really do about it? Is, is, is better blood pressure or glycemic control, avoidance of nephrotoxins? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about diet. Uh, can we do something to actually affect this? And there have now have been a large number of other genome-wide association studies uh, in, in both patients with diabetes uh, as well, uh, looking at different um, uh, risk alleles that may uh, uh, confer uh, kidney uh, disease. And um, there's a lot of um, interest in this. It's hard to tease this out with, you know, uh, when you have a common disease which, which has a multiplicity of possible genetic uh, loci that may uh, regulate this. So let me turn now from biologic to environmental. Um, this, this is a study that, my, uh, that I developed in Baltimore. It was a neighborhood study where we looked at, uh, we formed a cohort of different neighbors, uh, neighborhoods in Baltimore. And we looked at the percentage of participants with CKD among those who had low socioeconomic status and among those who had higher socioeconomic status. And you can see that low socioeconomic status appeared to be associated uh, with uh, having uh, C, uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, however, this was only true 
for African Americans uh, and not for whites. If anything, it was the, the opposite uh, uh, way. Um, and so that makes us think that, in fact, could there be environmental factors or even behavioral factors? And um, uh, I began doing work using the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is a survey of the U.S. population where we get many of our statistics uh, on different chronic diseases. And what we did is we took individuals who enrolled in NHANES, but we linked them to the Medicare ESRD registry to see who developed kidney disease over time. And uh, this shows that the risk, the relative risk of developing kidney disease for blacks versus whites was uh, about almost threefold when you, uh, uh, even if you adjust for age and sex. If you adjust for socioeconomic status, you can explain about 12% of that risk. And then if you adjust even further for lifestyle factors such as physical activity or body mass index or other uh, habits, you, you can uh, explain about a quarter of the risk. So that made us think, well, gosh, what other things could be driving this? And I got interested in the work of Don Welth Wesson uh, in, uh, in Texas, who had been looking at dietary acid load and its effect on kid kidney damage and progression. And he had generated a lot of data that looked at animal, well, animal and patient data that showed that cytokines are associated uh, with progressive nephropathy, that they increase with the amount of uh, dietary acid load. Uh, and, a, and a diet that is low in uh, acid is one that is rich in fruits and vegetables. In fact, we know that uh, from small clinical trials that administration of sodium bicarbonate is associated with decrease in kidney disease. And Don showed also that diets uh, that are rich in fruits and vegetables, you can actually replicate giving sodium bicarbonate to uh, decrease uh, uh, kidney disease in individuals who have hypertension. And that evidence, there was ev no good evidence in the general population. So we did the same thing where we linked this, the National Health and Nutrition Examination participants with the ESRD registry where there's good data about diet uh, through a 24-hour dietary recall questionnaire. We looked over 15 years uh, among individuals at higher or low dietary acid low, whether they developed uh, ESRD. And this is, um, this is a complex slide, and I, and I just showed, I'll, I'll try to break this down for you. What's in this box is, shows the dietary acid load for minorities, for those who have, uh, who are in poverty or low socioeconomic status, and those who have uh, by education. But what it shows is that minorities have a higher dietary acid load, whether it's blacks or Mexican Americans, and those who uh, have a lower income is measured by the poverty income ratio also uh, have a higher dietary acid load, as well as individuals who uh, have less education. Um, and this is, this is what we found in looking over many years, that those who had the highest dietary acid load had a higher probability of developing ESRD. Um, but interestingly, this, this was more powerful in African Americans than it was uh, in, in whites. Uh, and we showed this recently, actually, in another way by looking at uh, d the DASH diet, which is a diet that's high in fruit and vegetables, and whether that's associated with the risk of ESRD. And there was a hint that it, in non-Hispanic blacks, it, there was a, a greater uh, progression than among non-Hispanic uh, whites. Uh, we've also looked at the concept of food security, you know, food security is the perceived ability to access nutritious and healthy foods 
with essential uh, nutrients. And um, you, you can see that individuals that were food insecure had a higher incidence of developing uh, end-stage kidney uh, uh, failure. Uh, and um, that was partially mediated by nutritional factors, including high dietary, high levels of dietary acid load. And we know that, in fact, minorities are uh, less food insecure. So raising the possibility that diet is a, is a lifestyle factor. So let's talk a little bit about quali- you know, what we do, the quality of care and the adequacy of care. Um, I, I run a program for the uh, Center for Disease Control where we track uh, kidney disease in the United States. And it's one part of that we have looked at blood pressure control among different ethnic minorities. And this, this uh, shows the percentage of participants in uh, the United States with uncontrolled blood pressure. Uh, By two definitions, well, this is for both individuals without chronic kidney disease and those with chronic kidney disease, but uh, as measured by um, uh, uh, a blood pressure 140 over 90 or newer guidelines would say it should be 130 over 80. But regardless of the definition, you can see that African Americans, both without and with CKD, have higher rates uh, as well as Mexican American, higher rates of uncontrolled uh, blood pressure. So it raises the question of, of, in fact, is it because we're not controlling blood pressure higher? So the opportunities to improve outcomes in patients with kidney disease are blood pressure lowering, reduction of proteinuria, the use of ACE and ARBs, the prevention of acute kidney injury, and also new glycemic agents in people uh, with uh, diabetes. It, this is really what we have now uh, in our armamentarium. Now, one of the disappointing things, you all know the recent uh, SPRINT uh, blood pressure intervention trial that showed that lowering of blood pressure lowered uh, the com- uh, risk of composite outcome of cardiovascular events. Um, but what was interesting, there was no difference in the composite of ESRD uh, or 50% decline in EGFR. And African Americans were similar to white. So very disappointing that even this, this one of our most classic studies uh, showed that lowering blood pressure even further uh, might uh, help. So back to this study. So I said that 25% of the risk could be explained by lifestyle factors. So if you took into account care quality, blood pressure, uh, uh, diabetes control, uh, uh, control of other cardiovascular risks, you can explain up to 30, uh, a third of the difference, risk risk reduction between African Americans and whites. So you put all those factors together, you can actually explain almost a half, uh, almost half of the risk. So it raises the question, well, what's left? And we did this study prior, actually, to the work that uh, was done on genetics. So the question is, is that other excess risk due to genetic factors or even other unmeasured socioeconomic factors, lifestyle, quality of care factors? Um, So... um, I want to talk a little bit about, we talked a little bit about why this individual might have developed kidney disease. I want to talk a little bit about further downstream of what happens to individuals who uh, who uh, get kidney disease in their care. Um, and this was an interesting study where we, we studied the problem that this in, that my patient had, um, who was, our patient was found, uh, in kind of found in the emergency room with kidney failure, okay, rather than prepared. And we we showed this study uh, several years ago about the timing of specialist evaluation of chronic kidney disease. And we found that over one-third of black dialysis patients, these are black females or black males, received a late evaluation by a nephrologist 
that is less than four months before dialysis uh, compared to white males or white females. Um, and in fact, um, the timing of evaluation was associated with their albumin levels, a measure of nutritional status, their hematocrit levels, as well as whether they got therapy for anemia. Um, and uh, uh, one of our, our, my colleagues at Hopkins uh, recently studied whether this problem has gotten worse or, worse or better over time. This is the odd ratio of pre-dialysis nephrology care uh, by year. And if anything, uh, it seems to have gotten worse, uh, not only for uh, African Americans, but also for Hispanic uh, Americans. So what's the problem with that? Well, in this study, we showed that late specialty referrals resulted in worse mortality overall, um, but up to sevenfold greater for blacks than for whites. So having a late referral uh, contributed to uh, mortality. Um, so why is this important? Poorly prepared patients uh, 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 miss opportunities to make informed treatment choices about therapy, uh, hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis, or even getting a transplant. And there's many debates about uh, going on about different dialysis treatments. Um, the people say the risk of deaths in the first year of treatment for peritoneal versus hemo is, is uh, similar, but that hemodialysis may yield better long-term outcomes, but that self-care modalities like peritoneal dialysis may enhance quality of life. And of course, transplants are, uh, are, are better, live donor transplant even better, and preemptive transplants even better. And this patient really mm -hmm. had no opportunity uh, for that. So um, we know that ethnic minorities are less likely to be treated with home dialysis. There's less likely to be waitlisted and transplanted. They're less likely to receive live kidney transplant, less likely to have knowledge of therapies, and less knowledge of transplant prior to dialysis initiation. And low health literacy has been associated with uh, transplantation. And we know that uh, less knowledge uh, that when patients are evaluated for a transplant, uh, when you account for knowledge, that actually can ameliorate uh, differences in uh, in uh, transplantation. So, patient like having a late evaluation leaves no opportunity for this. So, my last area I want to talk t about is healthcare policy. Um, so let's go back to our patients. So since the onset of ESRD, he was unable to work and had an inability to pay for health care with his undocumented status. So he presents to the emergency room with uremic uh, symptoms at least weekly. He's dropped off by his family at 4.30 in the morning. The ED physician makes a decision based on the physical exa examination and tests, does serum electrolytes, uh, uh, blood oxygenation, a 12 lead echocardiogram. And so he waits patiently in the ED alongside 10 to 15 other similar patients, all of whom are hoping for one thing, a single dialysis treatment that day. Um, and if he has hyperkalemia, or low oxygen sat due to volume overload, he qualifies for one emergency dialysis treatment with a catheter. Otherwise, he's sent home and told to return another day. So after a few months, he moves from Oregon to California. So why? Because Actually, the, as an undocumented immigrant, you really don't have access to care except for one safety net, and that's EMTALA, our law that says that anyone who goes to an emergency room can be treated. So that actually allows the nationwide use of federal Medicaid funds 
uh, to undocumented immigrants the safety net of the emergency room. Now, some states deem actually ESRD as an emergency medical condition that allow uh, Medicaid payment for standard outpatient care, whereas other states do, meaning that uh, do not, meaning that ESRG treatment can only occur in the emergency room. So why have states been different? Maybe there's concerns and fears about providing care outside of emergency department because of the heavy burden to U.S. taxpayers. It might encourage medical tourism or undocumented immigrant rates might surge. Uh, so we just uh, last week, we published this uh, sort of small study where we looked at the provision of outpatient dialysis for undocumented immigrants with ESRD in the United States. Uh, uh, my colleague Lilia uh, Cervantes at, uh, at uh, University of Colorado in Denver Health led this. And what you see in green is the states where they deemed uh, ESRD an emergency medical condition. It allows the use of standard routine dialysis treatment three times a week. And what's in the orange is where states that don't actually deem ESRD as an emergency medical condition. But in fact, there are other funds that the states or providers have come to the rescue. And then uh, the states in red are where Medicaid does not provide reimbursement for standard dialysis and no other funds are uh, available. Um, so I'm going to show you a study that we did recently. Lily's work in Colorado led to Colorado moving from red to green. And this is some of the work that influences. This was a, a, a study that we looked at emergency only versus standard hemodialysis uh, and its association with mortality and health care use among undocumented immigrants. So we did a cohort study. We did it in Denver, in Houston, and in San Francisco at my hospital. Uh, and we looked at undocumented immigrants who developed the SRD from 2007 to 2014. And exposure was access to emergency versus standard dialysis. We followed people over five years looking at mortality and health care use. Um, and because it was not a randomized trial, we used this method of propensity score analysis to adjust for differences in the groups. These are the care practices. This is Harris Health in Texas and Denver Health in Colorado. So to receive emergency hemodialysis, you must be critically ill uh, with these either signs or symptoms. You actually get a fistula placed at Denver Health that's required them to have emergency, but required to have emergency presentation before being admitted for two consecutive hemodialysis sessions on two consecutive days. So on average, patients receive a treatment every six to seven days. In Texas at Harris Health, they actually get one session of hemodialysis, and so they get about two to three uh, uh, times uh, per uh, week. And uh, at my hospital, you get an AB fistula placed, and you received uh, treatment not through the emergency room, but through an outpatient setting. But this is what we found in cumulative mortality that uh, you can see the cumulative mortality was uh, over five years was uh, about 60 percent compared to in emergency hemodialysis compared with standard hemodialysis of about 10 percent, so six times greater risk of death. And there uh, were more acute care days and more bacteremia episodes, although not significantly, statistically significantly different, and more ambulatory visits than uh, standard uh, hemodialysis. So this raises the issue um, that I like to use this uh, uh, picture that uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation generated the issue of equality, equity, and justice. One could think of MTAL, the safety net of emergency care, as equality. But equity might be that local care providers uh, provide the support that everyone needs. But justice might be that we change health care policy and we provide 
routine dialysis under emergency Medicaid. So what I've tried to show you is through the lens of kidney disease, um, how one can look at disparities. There's been a, a lot of other work that one can do this in, too, in breast cancer, heart failure, uh, preterm birth, where um, all these conditions have interactions with genetics and, I think, environmental and social factors that uh, influence uh, uh, outcomes, influence disease and influence uh, outcomes. This is a paper uh, my colleague Esteban Bouchard uh, wrote that was in PLOS Medicine a couple of years ago. So in summary, um, what I tried to do is show you an ethnic minority patient with a late presentation for care, poor preparation for ESRD, and urgent hemodialysis initiation. I tried to show you that biologic, socioeconomic, behavioral, and clinical determinants uh, conspire to compromise health differentially for different diseases. Treating disease at end stage is costly, both personally and financially, and limits access to optimal therapies. And we need to preempt illness early um, using molecular knowledge, therapeutics, behavioral environment, and policy interventions. I think ignoring diversity is a missed scientific opportunity to understand factors that lead to disease and to human health. And so back to my premise, my premise is that science on disparities enhances all of medicine and human health. So thanks for your attention. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to speak to you today, and I'm delighted I was invited. Uh, invited me. Thanks. So, uh, I usually have questions, and then uh, Dr. Poe will repeat the question and answer it. Yes. <clears throat> the patient you presented raises the issue of access to primary care physicians, particularly mm -hmm. in physician shortage areas. Could you say a word about community health centers, which now accommodate 27 million patients? 50% of these are Medicaid, but the, the, many of the remainders are uninsured. It's now a political process underway to get another $4 billion a year funding in Congress for uh, community health centers. This has always been an enormous struggle, yeah. and we really need to support this. Yeah, so, you know, my I work in a public hospital. We are um, part of a, what's the San Francisco Health Network that includes 12 uh, 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 federally qualified health centers in the city. We serve as the, kind of the safety as well as having two primary care, well, three primary care large clinics on our, our campus. And that is the safety net for uh, many patients. It's why the patients... I showed you the, the demographics of the patients in my hospital, and that's why, because we feed off of this. Uh, uh, the, the patients come to us from this network, and I think that's only a microcosm of what we see around the United States, um, and that we, we need that as a safety net. Unfortunately, I think that the turn to to roll back the Affordable Care Act also influences uh, also care to groups that stand on the borderline of being able to get health insurance. Um, I can tell you, uh, two days ago, um, our governor signed a bill to provide in California health insurance for undocumented immigrants up to age 26, okay? Um, he wanted to go higher in age <laughs> to even elders, uh, but it was cost prohibitive for, to do that. It would cost, cost billions of dollars, but it was, it's a first step. And I think we need to think about health care and delivery systems for all of us. Uh, if we're going to solve problems like this. So I, pointing this out, I think, is very important, the need for um, the, a safety net of community health centers, I think, not only in urban areas but in rural areas as well. Other questions? 
Okay, so um, that's a yeah. So the question is, how do we do compare to? How does the United States do compared to other nations, particularly, let's say, uh, Europe? Um, this is something that was very interesting to me uh, years ago when I began looking at different, actually, dialysis treatments, um, and it, it's interesting that. Um, if you look at end-stage kidney disease, we use uh, peritoneal dialysis much less than even our northern neighbors in Canada uh, uh, um, and in Europe. Um, now, inherently, peritoneal dialysis is less, you know, people are doing their own dialysis. It's less costly. But in this country, we've invested in um, in uh, dial in in person hemodialysis uh, facilities, right? In fact, three quarters of individuals in this country receive care from for-profit uh, dialysis centers. There are two companies that provide the majority of the care in the United States. Some people say, well because we've invested and built dialysis centers when the next patient comes along and there's room in, the, in, in a hemodialysis unit, we ought to do hemodialysis. Um, and, um, and that's why peritoneal dialysis has uh, uh, rode it. Transplantation is, you know, a, a big issue. I, I think you, it's often resource limited and countries, you know, that are developed do a better job at providing, um, for example, transplantation than in other parts of the world where that's not available in um, less developed uh, uh, countries. We actually don't know a lot about um, uh, racial and ethnic diversity in other countries. You know, this is a phenomenon of America that we perseverate on race and ethnicity, and we have the data actually uh, to be able to look at uh, issues along racial and ethnic lines. So we study this a lot more in this country uh, than in other countries, and that may be because of the diversity of our, probably diversity of our population. You know, because in the end, we're all immigrants, right? <laughs> so uh, we've come from all over the world. So. Brad. Brad. Thank you, Neil. Um, so since you have a, you know, one of the most diverse patient populations and a very large research portfolio for a you know, public hospital, um, can you talk a little bit about you know, how that goes? A lot of places have very, uh, maybe not the best um, relationship with the communities, and how you can do research in, in a diverse population. Yeah, so I think community engagement. We, it, it, a lot of my faculty do a lot of work in, you know, community-based participatory research, and we engage the community in big ways, in many ways, um, you know, through. Uh, listening to them, having them on having them on advisory boards, um, and there's a tremendous amount of work. We do a lot of work around homeless uh, homelessness and health care, for example. Um, I do have to say that we um, we have now taken a very intensive look at disparities within our institution. And I'm ashamed to say that, in fact, we have disparities within our own institution. We are trying to understand that um, and understand whether it's the quality of care that we're delivering or whether there are other social determinants or behavioral determinants. For example, one area that we struggled a lot with is uh, readmissions to the hospital for, uh, you know, for heart failure. And, in fact, we had... Uh, and, and another area is, is blood pressure control. And we had differences in both blood pressure control in the community for African Americans versus whites and enormous differences in 
readmissions for heart failure, uh, very high rates among African Americans versus white. So we're, we, we, we've made some progress on the blood pressure control front. The, and we're trying to understand um, uh, in our data and why individual, why are ethnic minorities uh, unable? It might be that they live in communities where there's less resources, and we're trying to understand that and put res actually work with people in the community to put resources there uh, in the community. Uh, and it may be homelessness that's part of that as well. So we're we're doing a lot of work in that area, but I had the answer is we're doing a lot of work in that area, but we haven't solved some of the problems. I think it's great that we're taking a look at it, looking at ourselves, or looking at our own data, and trying to solve that. Uh, other questions come up to the front. Fifteen minute break. Is that okay? Then we're coming back to start at nine thirty. Thank you very much.